So to celebrate uh, National Hispanic Heritage Month this year, the Humanities Forum presents Carolina Guerrero, Breaking the Language Barrier One Story at, one story at a Time. Just a quick fa fact, do you guys know that the National Hispanic Heritage Month is started as not the Hispanic Heritage Week, okay? It, that was in 1968. And fortunately, in, since 1988, we get a whole month from September 15th to October 15th. This month is a national uh, celebration of the role Latino cultures have, of the role uh, Latino cultures have played in the culture and the history of the United States. As our communities are still target of harmful policies in our current political climate, I invite you to truly celebrate what this month that started as just one week means uh, to this country. A celebration of our country's diversity and of the traditions and stories of Hispanics, Latinas, Latinos, Latinx, Afro-Latinos, and our indigenous communities. That's what we need a whole month. And those that have helped shape this country's history. This is one of the many reasons why we're very happy to have Carolina Guerrero here at UMBC. Um, Carolina Guerrero is a co-founder and executive director of Radio Ambulante, a groundbreaking Spanish language podcast that tells neglected and underreported Latin American stories. Uh, founded in 2011 by a team led by award-winning novelist Daniel Alarcón and entrepreneur Carolina Guerrero, Radio Bulante has produced more than 60 episodes from more than 20 countries and partnered with uh, English language uh, outlets like Planet Money, Radio Lab, The New York Times Magazine, and This American Life. Okay. Radio Bulante's groundbreaking work has been celebrated across the U.S. and in Latin America and was honored with a Gabriel Garcia Marquez Prize uh, for Innovation in Journalism in 2014, which is a very prestigious uh, journalism award in Latin America. Before co-founding Radio Bulante, Carolina Guerrero worked as a promoter for cultural and, uh, for culture and social projects, creating a bridge between organizations in her native Colombia and public and private institutions in Latin America and uh, in the United States. Guerrero is passionate about solving the problem of inequality across inequality of access and democratizing the kinds of stories being told across the, re the region. Um, Guerrero was a John S. Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford University. And as a loyal fan of Radio Bulante, I welcome uh, Carolina Guerrero. <laughs> So thank you for having me. Um, I'm very, very, very excited to be here to talk about uh, Radio Ambulante. Thank you for the introduction. Just a little detail. Uh, we have now like more than 100 episodes produced. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we have speed that uh, very quick. Um, oops, is it? We'll see. But, uh, I, don't worry, I have like 100 slides, so I will just keep going. Uh, okay, I think uh, I want to start because a anyone, in, everyone is familiar here with Radio Ambulante. Can you please, can we do a show of hands who's, who knows the project? Okay. And how many of you speak Spanish? Or like some Spanish? I think that's also, oh, that's better. Okay, <laughs> many. Uh, we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna do this in English, uh, so don't worry, but I'm gonna start playing some audio so you can know what we do. <laughs> this story, this is a very short story. Uh, Radio Ambulante's episodes are like, are like between like 22 minutes and one long and one hour. So let's start with this one. Eh, a Londres llegué en octubre de 1996, eh, sin hablar una sola palabra de inglés, con una carta que decía que estaba matriculado en el Hampstead School of English. Me acuerdo que eh, me pusieron muy orgullosamente en, ni siquiera se llamaba beginner, sino elementary. Y la primera clase aprendimos los colores. <risa> Blue. Red, <laughs> green. <laughs> My name is Hernando. Pero así era, yo tenía 24 años. <laughs> ya pasé de elementary, pasé a beginners, pasé a intermediate y en intermediate eh, había un profesor que se llamaba William y me gustaba mucho sus clases porque el tipo lo que hacía es que escogía un tema y decía, bueno, hoy el tema hoy es tal y sobre esta cosa vamos a aprender vocabulario. 
Hoy vamos a hablar del miedo. Esos momentos en que todos hemos vivido y, y que nos hemos estado muy realmente con mucho susto, mucho miedo. Entonces quiero que por favor todos cierren los ojos y piensen en los momentos más asustadores de su vida. Y yo realmente me tomaba la clase muy en serio y a mí esos ejercicios siempre me han gustado. Yo tuve una infancia bastante cómoda en Colombia, pero me sorprendió mucho que al cerrar los ojos me empezaron a llegar una cantidad de imágenes aterradoras de mi vida. La primera que tengo de memoria, yo estaba muy, muy chiquito, tendría 5 o 6 años y a unas 10 cuadras de la casa, esto en el norte de Bogotá, eh, hubo unos atracadores que entraron a casa y llegó la policía y, y hubo una, un, un intercambio de disparos. Me acuerdo que mis hermanos eran mayores, todos en bicicleta, salieron corriendo a mirar qué había pasado. Ya había, llegamos en el momento en que había un cordón policial, pero con el típico desorden, yo no sé cómo yo terminé metido dentro de la casa. Y alcancé a ver... Eh, manchas de sangre y un cuerpo de alguien a alguien que le han disparado y que se había muerto en el parque de mi casa donde jugaba que en un, un parque de clase eh, acomodada digamos que donde no le pasaba nada había un senador que vivía por ahí y entonces estaba vigilado por unos eh, PMs como le decimos en Colombia policía militar nosotros jugamos fútbol y de golpe alguien en un carro le empezó a disparar a los PMs y él le empezó a disparar y nosotros terminamos botados en el, en el, en el piso como si fuera una película mientras disparaban me acordé también de una situación muy complicada haciendo reportería una vez que alguien me terminó poniendo un, un revólver en la cabeza y entonces yo estaba con todas esas imágenes en la cabeza y decía, uy, ¿cuál de estas voy a contar? ¿Cuál es la mejor para contar? Porque pues obviamente uno siempre quiere contar un buen cuento. Y en esas pasaron los cinco minutos y entonces William dijo, ok, vamos a ir entonces a contarnos. Entonces le preguntó al suizo, me acuerdo muy bien que empezó a hablar el suizo y dijo, no, yo me acuerdo una vez que llegué a la casa, abrí la puerta de la casa y mi mamá estaba detrás de la puerta y me hizo, buh. Y uy, me acuerdo el susto que me dio, casi me muero el susto y mamá nunca pensé que me había sorprendido. Eh, creo que era un sueco, una vez que se perdió en un centro comercial y que entonces un guardia lo, lo tuvo y que fueron 20 minutos o media hora en que la mamá no aparecía y él lloraba, él lloraba. Y las historias eran todas como de ese estilo, hasta que William me dice, ok, Hernando, what about you? Y, yo, y, yo, y ante el, el, el nivel sangriento de mis historias, decidí decirle, no, no, yo en realidad no me puedo acordar de ningún momento así como miedoso. Entonces, ay, no, qué macho, qué macho. Me decía, latino, macho, ¿no? Con su, <ríe> su forma toda mensaje. Quedé como un pendejo, pero realmente no me daba la idea para contar ninguna de esas historias aterradoras que, que me tocó vivir porque, pues, porque crecí en Colombia. So, in 2007, uh, Daniel Alarcón, who's the co-founder of Radio Ambulante and the host, um, was hired by the BBC. He's also my husband, um, <laughs> by the way. So he was hired by, by BBC to uh, produce an audio documentary in his uh, native Peru. It was about uh, Andean migration. And he was hired, actually, because he published before a novel. He's a novelist or he was a novelist now, he's a really producer, but he was a novelist and he produced, um, he wrote a book about radio. And uh, so he was asked to go with a radio producer to Peru and work on and conduct a, a bunch of interviews in English and Spanish. He was a, the, the Spanish speaker of the crew. And, um, and he spent a couple of weeks there and went back to the United States where he used to live. And uh, a month later he receives, uh, received the, the final, the link to the final mix of the story, and Daniel was very disappointed because most the most compelling voices uh, of the story were left out because th th those voices were in Spanish. So Daniel was left with a question, no? What if there was a space for those voices on the radio waves, no? And what would it sound like? So years later, uh, in 2011, Daniel and I were having coffee in San Francisco, California, and planning the future, and we decided to create a space Daniel told me, hagamos lo de la radio, no? And it was a conversation that we were like, like that we had like many times. We were avid listeners of public radio. Uh, we admire shows like, shows like This American Life or Radio Lab, uh, if you are familiar with one of those. Uh, they were on the radio actually at the time. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we were always like finishing an episode of the, 
one of those shows and were complaining, like thinking, oh, wow, this was great. I hope there will be something like that from Latin America. No, we knew, we heard those stories all our lives. Um, and we wanted to have, to, to have a space like that, like feeling represented on those shows. So we decided to create it. it is. So Radio Ambulante is a project of narrative uh, journalism in sound. Uh, we want to offer, as, as Tania mentioned before, a space um, to hear uh, and their reported and neglected stories from Latin America and, um, and, and the US. No, we want to bring news, new voices to the, to the media outlets as well. It's like the, 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 there is like a, we, ha we know that the United States, they don't, like the Latinos don't get as much representation, not only their stories are not always told, but also like there are not enough spaces for this producer. So we want to bring more of those. So uh, at the time, that was 2011, uh, we didn't do a market research or anything like that. General marketing research, not, nothing. We just had a lot of passion and drive. Uh, we went home. That, that night, we sent an email to a bunch of uh, journalists that we knew, like 30 people that we knew in Latin America, and, um, and, and told them the story. This format, this long form, so what I'm describing is long form audio journalism, like right? stories that are character driven. So we send an email, but in Latin America, in Spanish, there was not something like that. So we had to explain a bit what we were doing. And next morning, we woke up, and we had um, already stories and ideas. So we knew that we had something. And, and we believe that that was a perfect moment uh, to, to do Rayo Ambulante, because uh, we believe so we believe that political borders are um, real, but cultural and linguistic borders are very fluid. We also are convinced that the United States, with more than 50 million um, Latinos and Spanish speakers, or able to understand Spanish, is another Latin American country. And we also know that technology has changed the way we produce and share content. So, so we knew that that was a, moment, a good moment to, to, to produce audio. But most of all, we knew that a well-told story is universal and, and crosses borders. So uh, that we were very enthusiastic about Radio Ambulante, but there was a problem. We didn't know anything about radio. So we were like, OK, now <laughs> we have to learn, because we already have promised to create this show. We already have pitches. So we had to teach ourselves. And of course, that teaching uh, included like going and do some consultations. So we go, oh, who do we know? Who do we know? And oh, this reporter, she's an NPR in Bolivia. Or like this uh, NPR uh, Peruvian, Mandalita del Parco. No? We were like trying to find like whoever, like Latino, we knew that who could understand and could give us some training or something. Uh, so on that, we heard things like this, uh, a lot of skepticism, um, you know, like uh, pro oh, producing, I have to read from here because I don't have glasses. Mm -hmm. Producing such stories sounds great, but to what extent? The what? Podcast? You know, at the time, it seemed that nobody was like, like it's so much into believing much in, in podcasts. Um, and also, like, I consulted with a, a person at a, a big media outlet uh, who was the head of radio, and he appreciated the enthusiasm, but was very skeptical because for him, um, Mexicans only listen to, to stories from Mexico, Argentinas from Argentina, Puerto Ricans from Puerto Ricans. So he said, oh, yeah, this will never be successful. No, I'm so glad I didn't, because I, I, I took a flight to Miami to talk to him. <laughs> and then, so I'm so glad I, I didn't. I didn't follow his advice. Um, so what we wanted, to, we talked about all this because there was a, a lot of resistance for a Spanish language uh, audio project in the United States. We heard all the time, like, do it in English, no? And we knew that this journalism ha had to be um, created in Spanish. So we, we kept our, our goal, tried to focus on our goal. And, and just like what we want to do is, is to cover Latin America like nobody does. We really want to complicate your story of Latin America. It's, not, it's just like broad your, like the, the conversation and bringing all of you closer to, to the idea that you have of Latin America. Because we, we hear like certain narratives, but we feel that this is very narrow. So with that in mind, uh, I, I would describe a Radio Ambulante story. It's complex, it's nuanced, it's entertaining, and it's moving. Uh, has characters, uh, narrative arc, a beginning and an end. It's always surpri surprising and unique. 
so this is like a kind of like we use the same element elements that non-fiction uses in, on print, but bring them to to the um, to the format of audio. We ask when we interview characters, we ask them to describe scenes. If this is you, you want me to turn on the turn off the the screen, it's okay. You want okay okay. Um, uh, so if uh, so when we interview uh, characters uh, for Radio Mulante, we ask them to describe scenes. To, to describe feelings, you know, like it's, it's very, very personal journalism. I call it personal journalism. Daniel doesn't like it, but it's, it's really like because we do a lot of fact checking and and and, and a lot of we have, we report rigorously, but for us, it's, it's just like telling stories uh, from the perspective of the protagonist of the story because we want to make sure that we're telling the stories. Um, that like 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 the voices of like Buenos Aires that make Buenos Aires or Peru or Lima or Bogota uh, like a city like those cities alive are telling the stories from the inside out. So that's why we want to like be very incisive with our interviews. Uh, so how does it sound? Um, I want to play some audio. Uh, I like this quote from a, a revista uh, Que Pasa Chile uh, that says Radio Ambulante has become Latin America's radio where all accents blend and borders disappear. Uh, and uh, it's not that we wanted to uh, unify all the accents or like all the, the cultures, actually just the opposite. We wanted to, to make sure that we create Radio Ambulante to understand what makes us different and how we are similar. No? Like we want to make sure that we have a story from Chile and you can really react to that story or like create some empathy if you are here in Baltimore no, and, and, and I think that's uh, like the power of, of audio. Uh, we believe that the, the human voice is, uh, is, is like, has this power that you somehow trust that voice. So the format, and now that everything is in podcast with your earplugs, um, it's really like a, like a friend telling you a story and you, you, you kind of let uh, those voices uh, tell a story uh, that you probably wouldn't like or like hear necessarily because it's from other place and other country. Okay, so I want to play. I'm not sure if I'm, we're gonna try. I have a couple of clips uh, that describe how does Latin America sound for Ambulante. This is not story driven, so maybe if we miss a, a part, you will just recognize a couple of accents. So this is from our first season. Um, uh, this is how it sounded a bit, just to have some voices, but I'm not sure. If Empatado, porque no ver tantos cadáveres, no encontrarse en el río siete, ocho seguidos, muy berraco, y en la noche. Bueno, venía llegando a mi casa y vi una gran cantidad de jóvenes vestidos de negro en el medio de la calle, pero no, no distinguí ninguna cara, ¿no? Punk significa ser un hombre bien responsable en sí mismo. Si tú chupas, mañana trabajas. Entonces la gente subía al cerro y, y él veía a la Virgen y hablaba con ella y él le decía cosas y él le transmitía. Y yo le dije, no, lo que pasa es que yo siempre cumplo lo que digo. Y él me dijo, en Argentina solo por eso serías una celebridad. No, mi no, Michael. ¿Cómo te llamas? Miracle. Dije, ¿eh? Miracle. Nunca pensé que ser director de la biblioteca significaba convertirse en una especie de Sherlock Holmes. Prendimos el informativo a las 6 de la mañana y estaban dando la noticia a la fuga. Y me quedé en medio, en medio de la pista, presidente de Honduras, electo democráticamente por el pueblo, en medio de la pista, en rope cama, en Costa Rica. And um, I'm going to try with this one. This is how we sound now. Amigos, Radio Ambulante regresa la próxima semana. Es cuestión de días nomás. Este 11 de septiembre traemos una nueva temporada con historias de toda la región. Le di como tres vueltas a mi vida a ver qué había hecho ilegal y no encontré nada. Yo tengo una reputación. Yo no voy a ponerme a aprender a montar bicicleta delante de mis compañeros. ¿Qué van a pensar que yo a los 20 años no sé montar bicicleta? Apetaba como sexo, 
muchas veces. Pero sexo, not good sex. <risa> Historias que enriquecen y complican tu visión de Latinoamérica. Contamos la historia detrás de uno de los juicios más polémicos en Puerto Rico. Decían que ojalá que te mataran a tu hijo, a tu hija, a tu mamá, a tu mamá. ¡Santo Dios! Si yo lo que hice fue mi trabajo. Investigamos la crisis migratoria en Venezuela, una crisis que está afectando a toda la región. Viste que todos parecemos hormigas cada vez que llueve. Sí. Antes corríamos para el techito, pero ahora todo el mundo para su carpa como hormiguita. Chiqui, 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 chiqui. Nuestra vida cabe en una maleta. Nuestra vida es una maleta. A 10 años de la redada migratoria más grande de los Estados Unidos, contamos la historia del pueblo en Iowa que lo vivió. Ahí llegó el oficial, dijo que el que se movía iba a disparar y que nadie se moviera. Al ratito estaba rodeado todo de migración. Tenemos historias de transformaciones que nadie se esperaba. Soy musulmana, mujer mexicana y musulmana. Que no me diga Trump. Va a ser la temporada más ambiciosa en la historia de Rambulante. 36 episodios, dos shows en vivo, innovaciones por el lado digital para estar cada vez más cerca de ustedes, nuestros oyentes. Escúchenos todos los martes a partir del 11 de septiembre en NPR One o donde escuches tus podcasts. Uh, so this, uh, as you see, like uh, what the, the last part, I'm not sure if the subtitles were like uh, working at the time, at the moment. Uh, Daniel said on this promo, which we just launched our new season. This promo is for this season, and uh, that we're producing 36 episodes. So let me tell you, like, uh, I want to give you like a, a bit of like a take on the process to produce this content because it sounds when you listen it's so easy to to listen to that then it seems that easy to produce. So I'm gonna just describe our process. Uh, we use technology, all the benefits that technology um, offer now to produce, uh, like this one, for example. You know, like sometimes it crashes, but uh, we we, sort of, we you know it's it's imperfect. So. Um, We are 14 people working from nine different places, cities. We are uh, in, in New York, Bogota. We have uh, people in Quito, in San Jose, in San Juan, in London, uh, Quito, like many places. Mexico, <laughs> I keep like, like forgetting because we keep growing the team. So we have basically, uh, we use Slack to communicate, Zoom, Dropbox uh, to share documents, recording like digital recorders, Trint, Uh, very recommended for people who want to transcribe. And, and this is how a Radio Ambulante meeting looks like. I hope it will show. Oh, it's not, but it was. Um, this, this is a photo of like a, a team basically working on teleconference. And this is how we, we create this content. So just, just to give you an idea of how intensive this process, this uh, internet process is. Okay, it's not working. Uh, because that's, uh, okay. So I will tell you. So we, we, we receive stories, we receive pitches the, from everywhere. Any, anyone can send us a, a pitch of a story. And, uh, and we just make sure that if it's a good fit for Ambulante, what we do is that we assign to the person who sent a pitch. All of you are welcome to submit pitches, by the way. Uh, so we make sure that we see, okay, is it character driven? Is there something unique, surprising of this story? So we receive like a lot of, uh, oh, I want to tell you this story about this community of women, um, victims of uh, abuse in Nicaragua. So, okay, so that's not a story for Ramulante. The story will be, this is the story of Marta. No, she passed through this, this is da da da, and you know, like, like a, and, and this is how she overcame that. It's not that we do uh, personal superation stories, just, this is an example, but it's kind of like you want to see something that is unique because at the end, what do we do is, is narrate, we narrate stories on the way of nonfiction, no, like as, 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 a, as a movie, but this is journalism. So we receive the pitch, then we assign it to an editor. The editor works with this producer. We do research, and, uh, and then when the story is working, most of these journalists are like print journalists, because they, it, it's not common to work, to have, been, to have worked on, on, uh, on the long form audio. So we usually, like this editor, work very closely to the reporter. They set a, a bunch of questions, we assign an editor, we coach the interview, record the interview, tell them how to, to record it, uh, they go and record the interview, we transcribe all the audio, so pages of pages of audio. We create an outline, cut tape, um, write the first draft, and then we start like, with this, like writing many drafts. So it's, it's kind of writing first draft, edit, second draft, edit, 
read the tape to see if it works with the audio that we had transcribed, but we want to make sure that the voice of the character is strong enough to, to carry the story. If it sounds well, like mixing the narration of the of the journalist and the and the characters of the story, we write a third script, uh, a third draft of the script. We edit with a group, so we have then all the editors of Radio Mulat, they're working on this story for four, five, six hours, working on the script. And just to give you an idea, in, in audio, uh, uh, for stories like, like between like 30 minutes, that is the, 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 like the media of the time of a story of Radio Mulat, uh, we are talking about one page is one minute. So we're talking about like, like working on scripts of 30, 50 pages. So this is very intense. So they edit with the group. I, I, I didn't, I don't do it, they do it. Uh, they write a fourth draft. They, they go to tracking on studio. They, they create a rough mix, which is not the final mix. We see if it sounds well. Uh, that rough mix, including incorporating some, some music, some sound, sound effects, ambi sound that the, recorder, that the, the reporter rec recorded on, on, on the ground. Uh, and that's so, something that is very like we have to find like very skilled people to do that because uh, we don't want this music or sound to interfere with the story. We want just to to help create transitions, work with the sounds, maybe take some breathing, like <laughs> no, these kind of things. Um, but kind of like like accompany the mood, no. So it it requires like a like it's like this is like holding like like a little leg that will break the story is like like that. It's, it's uh, it's really a lot of work. Um, then the host, Daniel Tracks. Um, then we pass it to sound design, to final sound design. That takes like another week. And then we publish. And then after publication, now it's not just publishing. Before, I was uploading this to sound, SoundCloud, uh, sharing some apps, and go to Twitter and Facebook. But now we have like a lot of, another pro process of engagement that is like the new thing, no? And, and it's the most important thing, really, because it's a way to reach audiences and to make sure that they, the story is complete. I'm going to talk about that later. So in general, uh, producing a story, uh, we were on times like producing each episode of Rambulante, of those 36 that we're going to launch, the, that we just launched la last week, takes like a like between two and six months, but some of those stories take like one or two years to be produced. And there are stories, investigative stories that we're following. We have been following for two years, and we have we just learned that one is like we it's just developing in another story. So it's really really intense. So with this process in mind, as you imagine, like two people with no knowledge of any radio of how to produce radio, and and launching a podcast in 2012, we had like a couple of co-founders, uh, Martina Castro and Annie Correal. They were journalists, but they were not able to work on the podcast full time. So, so what we tried with Daniel was putting, learning and putting and finding talent, transferring the talent, growing, finding more talent, and like that. So um, two years ago we were six people. Now we're 14. But it took us like four years, bet like between 2012 and 2016, to 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 do this with just like a few people. So I'm going to describe how uh, our growth, like our process of growth. Uh, I'm going to probably skip this because it requires audio. We'll see if it works. Uh, but it's, um, So the thing is that it, like, uh, proving, like we, we had to prove a lot of, uh, like we, we have requested, we have been requested uh, with Radio Ambulante a lot to prove that this was a good idea. Even when we knew that it was a good idea, we have been like, we still listen to like things like this, no? Let's see, it works. Hey, excuse me, are you Carolina Guerrero from Radio Ambulante? Oh yes, no, I am Carolina Guerrero, how do you know? I'm a huge fan. No, oh, thank you, no? So what's your favorite episode of Radio Ambulante, tell me? Oh, actually, no, I don't speak any Spanish, like none. But I think you guys are just amazing. I love what you do. And, and uh, so, so that, that's very interesting, and also like this. And by the way, your English is so good. That I do believe it. <laughs> but with the, with the, with, but, but this is like something that we are always, yeah, of course. Yeah, the, the, we, we hear this all the time. But also we know that we can take that to our advantage. 
because in, in a way we have partnered with every single podcast like the one that we admire because they never see us as, as competitors as competitors no it's like a, and, and and really we hear all the time oh like uh, do you know a reporter in mexico we became like this point of contact between us in latin america for many media outlets and we are happy to do that because uh, like so we feel that we are very well placed because it's not just like helping media outlets here is just like bringing all those voices and stories from Latin America that usually they they hardly find space in, in, in media and whatever comes to, to American media is, is kind of global too so so we we think that that's a, a great thing um, and the other thing is that also like and so but we hear many many interesting things but we also think like listen to to things like that I'm gonna read it um, this is a tweet, a recent tweet. Uh, Radio Ambulante is so good. Not good for a Spanish language podcast. Great podcast without qualification. Probably in my top two shows of all time in English or Spanish. Every story is so good, I feel bad for people who can't listen in Spanish. So, so of course, like I like that tweet, of course. But, I, but it's true that, um, that what we try to to, try to tell people is that this podcast or that we try for excellence on producing every story and we want to make sure that this that this is just an accidental that is in Spanish uh, when we work in the United States because like sometimes people catalog like uh, plays Radio Ambulante on a category that is like oh yeah it's in Spanish so it's Latino so less funding less opportunity less pay for a sponsorship so we just continuously are like no 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 the, the same for sponsorship no we are like this trying all, always to 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 call the attention to funders and to possible investors or, or funders or like um, partners that we that this content is extraordinary um, so this is how we started um, this is a beautiful cute photo that probably you will see very quick those are um, my son and my nephews and niece. My nephew and niece. Uh, this was in Oakland, uh, California, farmers market. Actually, crossing the street, we had this bake sale and we were raising money for Radio Ambulante and we raised like three hundred dollars during our Kickstarter campaign, and we were so proud. But let me tell you, like uh, this graph, I, I hope that this works because it has important information. So we'll see if it's um, okay. So I'm gonna just describe it like this. Uh, so in two, we launched in, in 2012 after raising $46,000 in Kickstarter. Uh, by the time we produced um, seven, three episodes that contained seven stories, then, but we didn't know anything about that. We just like, it was so hard to produce the first season that we were like, oh, wow, fantastic. Then, so we, so we had like, we produced three long episodes with other stories. And we had like at the end, we were very proud to have uh, 7,000 7, downloads. That's orange, by the way. Look at, I will cut the color so you look very quick. Uh, yellow, 2013. Uh, so uh, the, we grew, we knew more, we knew better. So we were able to produce 10 episodes. Those episodes were like between 15 and 17 minutes, no? Uh, we were still learning. Uh, we were very proud of the 70,000 uh, downloads that we had. Then, um, in 2014, uh, so between 2013 and 2014, we started like, doing this, a lot of partnerships that I'm not gonna describe. And then we saw a jump to 700, that's green actually, 2014, and uh, we jumped to 700,000 uh, downloads 10 times we grew 10 times and um, and we did that with 15 episodes in 2015 we duplicated that to one and a half million and we were producing still 15 episodes uh, 2016 Brown uh, we, f we closed uh, we signed a distribution deal with NPR no and the idea of closing that, that deal was just to to make sure um, uh, it was uh, we, we see it as a win-win. They were trying to diversify their audience. We were in business for a long time, and they just like it was like a like a love story with NPR. We loved each other. Had to of course like negotiate a bit, um, but it was kind of a, so. What we have with NPR is an exclusive distribution deal deal that uh, contract that give us uh, full editorial independence. And, but it's a platform that had like they offer like a cutting edge technology and also like this the, the most powerful company like for audio out there. So and and for us it was like really like flattering that a company like NPR came to validate 
give us this seal of quality to our journalism. So, so with that, uh, the first season of, of uh, Radio Ambulante at NPR, we produced 24 episodes. We had more money that NPR deal brought foundation support uh, from Ford and MacArthur Foundation. Um, and we also have been seeing more listeners. 2017, is now the seasons are different. We just closed 2017 in, in, in June. We saw that our numbers are like reaching 4 million downloads. Uh, and now we projected that with the 36 episodes that we're going to produce now, uh, we're going to reach at least 5 million. This is the goal. Um, we are basing this on, on our growth from last year. We grew 89% in downloads and, and listenership. We still are on, on 400,000 downloads per month, which I'm going to compare it to other podcasts, but it's still very, very inc incredible. Uh, I mean, imagine how many stadiums are there, no? like how many people are listening. To, I, I, I compare just two stadiums, and I feel, wow, so many people listening to my stories. And, um, but, um, so for example, the, the biggest podcast, like This American Life, has like one million downloads per episode. So, um, but, but we have more niche Latinos. So, so I, my goal is that one. I don't know when it, it will happen. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna just show you, like, or tell you a bit, of, uh, I don't need to show you anymore. That was the, the key audience, but I'm gonna talk about our business model. So what we did at the beginning was like, we invested some personal money, uh, seed capital, Daniel invested that, then we raised some money on, on Kickstarter. We have always paid everyone pro, uh, working at Triambulante except Daniel, that he, he never, he, he, no. he started like, like, like receiving a stipend like two years ago with NPR, uh, but, but, but always respecting, like we wanted to be respected in the industry and we wanted to, to, to also like, um, feel res like that they respect our work, so we were always paying, so that's like, because it's a lot of work for the producer and for print journalism, uh, journalists. So um, uh, now our business model is, is kind of like a mix and mix pretty much of this distribution deal with NPR, which is a sponsorship deal. Basically, they find sponsors for Radio Ambulante, and, and we split the revenue, uh, and we have uh, foundation support as well. Uh, we have other, show, other sources of revenue. Uh, pretty much, uh, we have live shows, um, we have workshops, sometimes we do, but we don't do as much teaching, but we are sometimes doing teaching in Latin America, consulting, uh, we have subscription subscribers, um, anyone can become a subscriber, by the way, monthly, $2, $1. Uh, we receive donations, sometimes we just receive like people who send us checks, which is great. We are a non-profit organization, so that also helps having a status of a tax exempt status. We have an online store, so we do a lot of like little things. Uh, but the most revenue, and this, like for example, the online store brings like six thousand dollars per year. No, like it's just little revenue, but you just have to take from everywhere <laughs> because it's very, very crafty. Um, but this year we're working on a very exciting project that is a membership program, uh, trying to because we have a bigger team, we want to make sure that people that we can like get a, a closer collection uh, with the community. Um, we we expect to bring some revenue from there, that, but. Uh, but basically what we want to make sure is that uh, a membership program um, with rewards or with like a certain like benefits for the, for the member um, will help us actually like realize if we're accomplishing our mission or not, if we are really like serving our audience or not. And I think when people just like donate, it shows appreciation. There are many people who can donate. Of course, but I mean, like, like, like people, loyal people and, and followers. They really, really, when you see that they do this for you, it's it's a good sign. And I think this is important also to create a space. Um, and we are also designing an app. Finally, the Radio Ambulante app. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a second as well. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea of our audience split. So you will say like, yeah, a Spanish language podcast completely in Spanish, long form, requires concentration. Is that like, somebody said that we should never use the word documentary, but it's like, a because it sounds boring, but it's like a documentary. Uh, and this is not boring, by the way. Uh, so 70% of our audience live in the United States. And like 28% in Latin America, and then there is another percentage that is like from, we're listening from more than 100 countries. One third, but we have discovered also, we have like a close connection with the, with the audience and we have surveyed a lot. And we know that one third of the audience um, in the United States are non-Latinos or they identify 
themselves as non-Latino, non-native Spanish speakers. So we have done a lot of research for, for the last four years with this segment. And I know many of you are on that segment because it's basically Spanish learners. Uh, so we want to, so what we wanted to do is that, yeah, we have this story for Latinos, right, in Spanish. It can be like heard uh, by Spanish listeners. So we have always tried to break that language barrier by partnering with other organizations. Um, oh, okay, and 81% are under the age of 45. So we have partnership with, with we had partnerships at, at um, Tanya mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we have partnered with Radio Lab, with the New York Times Magazine, California Sunday Magazine, This American Life, you no know, other podcasts. Uh, and the way we do it is that sometimes we have, like for example, for print, just to make sure that the, when when it's audio, it's, it's easy. You just go there and, and they record the interview. They record the, the we 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 bring the audio. Somebody like the producer can talk in, in English. And, and be on the, on the radio with other podcasts. But for print, print is the best way to really break that language barrier for us in, at the moment, because what we do is that we bring our, all our stories are translated, transcripted and translated. So we just partner with Media Outlet and create print versions of the, of the, of the story. So for example, that story uh, that was about um, um, assisted uh, death, uh, we had a, a version for in the New York Times magazine, and that was amazing because we have like like a, like an engagement that we never saw before, like what 4,000 uh, comments to the story, but they they didn't came from Latinos. That came from people who are, were readers of the New York Times magazine, and it was just like re a reaction to talk about an issue, you know, like uh, like talking about uh, uh, assisted death, which is a very controversial, of course, subject. Another possibility, like uh, for example, this this this. This um, this partnership uh, was with Radio Lab. We have a story. Uh, it's called Los Sobrevivientes. Uh, it's a it's a very very recommended compelling story about um, self infected HIV patients in Cuba uh, or in rock stars. They were not patients. They became patients later. Uh, so with with Radio Lab, we we produce these stories together for one year. And uh, what the, we did is that our producer produced a, a, a version in Spanish for Ambulante and a version with Radio Lab in English. Two different stories, but connected. Uh, and we launched the same day. We put their story in English in our feed and our story on their radio in Spanish. It was, we experimented that a lot. But that's a, a great partnership, actually, because it was actually one of the most listened episodes of Radio Lab as well. Uh, and now, of course, with NPR, we, we also partnered with other shows like Planet Money, NPR, All Things Considered, we get space, we were uh, featured recently at and Code Switch and another, another podcast. One thing that we're doing is uh, opening the, um, the... Somehow we have seen that, that our content was there, but we were not really knowing if, if the audience was enjoying it, um, and we felt like incomplete. So we started, we hired a, an engagement editor last year, Jorge Caraballo, who's wonderful. And he kind of like found the voice of Radio Ambulante. Uh, it's, it's sometimes too annoying because he's like, he comes to like help us interact with the audience, but he's like really the advocate of the audience. So uh, everything that people requested, he requests, he could like, he come to me and I'm like, no, tell them that it's sad stories because experience is very, because they come, people, people complain that our stories sometimes are too hard and it's true or too sad. And it's true, uh, but we are the, we, we do we have also happy stories and in, and but but he comes and like he's like really like gives like the fight for the audience and say they want this they want this subject so uh, uh, we we have been trying to to really communicate with our audience better um, so the way we do it is that every Tuesday there is a a new story of Radio Ambulante if somebody has listens to podcasts you can find it in, everywhere on your phone. Uh, we released the story on uh, and both like our website and radioambulante.org and NPR websites. We sent a newsletter to people to let them know that there is a story, and we started like, doing these efforts of, of uh, cross promotion with NPR and doing more social media. We also created a group of WhatsApp. No, we don't have a group of WhatsApp. I'm sorry, apologize. It's, it's, it's different. We are reaching people out uh, via WhatsApp. So basically, if you're on WhatsApp, you can subscribe. And, and would you receive a, 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 a message just for you saying we have a new episode of Rambulante. We have we launched this this uh, initiative in December and we are communicating with this segment very well, one by one. So it's not 
at some point Jorge was just like getting crazy, like, oh, we have to talk and don't talk, send them to a group because we have groups. But the, the, the beauty of, of WhatsApp, in case that somebody wants to test something or engage people, um, you, you have to find the right tone to do it, uh, not, not abusing the WhatsApp, because if, if, if any of you are on WhatsApp, you know that if it, you receive too many messages, it's like kind of annoying. But it, this comes just with the, the message, and sometimes we ask people, like, um, I, uh, were you, for example, there is a story called Terremoto from Mexico uh, that we recorded a year ago that has many voices from Mexico, and, and we, we ask our listeners, uh, okay, can you please record what, where were you when the, ter uh, the earthquake uh, happened in Mexico? And people just send voice, voice messages uh, via WhatsApp, and we talk, took those voices and incorporated them into our uh, production. And it's a very, comp comp very, very beautiful episode, actually. Um, uh, so that's an example of the use of WhatsApp. Um, these people are like the most loyal people. You send, oh, can you fill this survey? They just do it like this. So it's a good, it's a good connection that we have in WhatsApp. Uh, every, like the thing is, like every connection that you create with the listener, uh, everywhere requires like a product. You know, so this is for WhatsApp. Uh, we have created also like something called Club the Podcast Radio Ambulante. It's a private uh, a club, uh, like a book club, but on, on Facebook, we, we try to create something where the listeners were. You know? at, the, at the time that Facebook was really like suffering of the reputation, we, we knew that our listeners are still on Facebook. And uh, so we created this group, and people ask requests to join. And there we have inter super interesting conversations about, about stories and, and different issues. So people, what we have been seeing there is that we ask a question, and people just uh, react and, and comment, and they, they come up, became like um, connected among them. And it's beautiful to see this conversation happening with people from all over the continent. No, we are like we have a policy of no, no harassment, like, no one can criticize any accent. Some people have like broken Spanish, that's fine, the conversation is in Spanish, but we accept everyone, and, and it's, it's really, really beautiful to see what's happening, and it's fun, super fun. Uh, we have Facebook Live with producers of the story, mostly every Friday. We also have playlists. So Jorge loves music, so he creates playlists for the per, te per, per subject, per country, per whatever he thinks, and it's super fun. A very recommended playlist. Um, and then we are also like a, we had this very boring newsletter that was kind of like send, we, we used to send on Tuesday. We still send that boring newsletter on Tuesday to let people know that there is a new episode. But we decided to give more value to the newsletter. So on weekends, we're sending one that is like the recommendations so like of the team. So people, basically our team, uh, everybody, like five, six people recommend something that they're reading, that they're interested on, that they saw, like whatever. And, and, and when you subscribe, you receive like different things. And I love like listening to new, I mean, learning about new things. So this has become very su successful. Uh, we feature one of the listeners of the week. We talk about dictionary from the country of origin of the of the where the stories come from. So this has been like great. And and what we do like uh, and and finally yeah I'm gonna close uh, soon. Um, so we we have been doing efforts to to okay this is okay. I'm gonna just like say it. so we have been doing a lot of efforts to to give resources to this to Spanish learners, but also to Hispanic, uh, to heritage students. You now there are many Latinos. Um, some of my colleagues as well, they are very intimidated by their Spanish. They speak only at home, but maybe they never wrote it. Maybe use are some of this, or like can relate to this. That's some, like, you, you just learn the language, but maybe when you need to, do you want to improve it, or you want to really access. And, and I think Rambulante, what brings, has created is this connection um, between Latinos and Latin America, and uh, not only to their country of origins, but it's just kind of like this visceral collection with the, with the language as well. Uh, so because we have a very small team and re limited resources, we usually launch an episode, and we have a transcription of the script in Spanish and a translation of the script in English. But the experience on our website is kind of like uh, not super fun because you have to go and listen to the audio, but then you have to just scroll down 30 pages of a script <laughs> in English and Spanish. <laughs> so we are now working. Uh, we we are, are now partnering with um, with a technology technology company, 
and um, and we are developing an app. And this app will uh, is is basically say, now it's called Trainer, but we're gonna try to find a, way, a nicer name. If you have any, please send it to me. Not any recommendations. Uh, so we basically will have our episodes available for people to being able to train their ear to understand different accents. We have identified on our content like 50 different accents. Uh, so it's not one per country, it's like many per countries. We still have to identify more, but the idea is that people who are like want to understand Rangula, they will be training their ear like while trying to guess some and listening, reading some Spanish. It's, it's kind of, I have a prototype if somebody wants to see, but my phone, but basically it's not just like, like 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 subtitles as we saw before because this is I, I, at the beginning I was like thinking oh yeah these subtitle <laughs> slides like audio but this is different this is kind of like help you to train your ear uh, select vocabulary slow down a bit past chapters we have like some cues like you know like uh, some work so and, and see your progress on the Spanish it's like like trying to like emulate a bit like the Fitbit uh, but on your work because every story takes a, a little time. So we're gonna launch this very soon, and we hope that uh, that we also like won't be free. We we hope not to make it very expensive, but we hope that this is a, another way in which we can really like serve better our audience, uh, one audience that is important for us, and and also like bring extra revenue to Ramblante that we need. Uh, because we, we want to continue innovating and, and, and create more, like maybe other shows, like more episodes, and, and that requires a lot of like, a, like growing. So, so this is what we're gonna do. Uh, other way to in, engage our community is uh, through live shows. We have uh, two coming, one in DC and one in New York in a couple of weeks. DC unfortunately is sold out. Uh, New York is close to sold out if it's not sold out now <laughs> because I, it was almost get ready to close. And, uh, and we do kind of this um, bilingual uh, accessibility. We subtitle everything so people can bring their special ones if they are not uh, Spanish fluent. Um, so, so hopefully you can make it at some point to, to one. And um, also we have a final project that is for journalists in Latin America. We're launching this that is called Escuela Radio Ambulante. We launched the website that are trying to give more resources in Spanish to learn how to uh, produce long form audio journalism and uh, and now I'm adding this part of like how to do a business out of it because that's the part that you never learn you just learn six years or like on the hard road <laughs> um, and finally I think just to close um, I feel um, so before I uh, I hired Jorge Caraballo our engagement editor I always felt I always describe Radio Ambulante as like our audience. We have three audiences, no? Like, so one was in the United States, and then there was the other audience in Latin America. And then we had, we knew that we have all these Spanish speakers, but at the end is, I think with all these efforts of like including everyone, including the Spanish, non-Spanish speakers, we are really like uh, one linguistic and cultural region. And this is what I feel that, um, is, is, is the way to, feel, to, to think about bilingualism or like multilingualism, uh, but in this case for us it's just two languages. It's just like thinking that we can really um, break those borders and, and create this the regional dialogue. Um, so thank you very much. That was my presentation. <laughs> I couldn't wait to upload that. Uh, thank you so much for the patience, apologies for the technical issue. Yeah, thank you, and I, I think that we were able to follow. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, the um, floor is open for questions. Yes. So I understand you've really developed this, and it's really incredible. Thank you for doing this work over the past six years. Um, at what point into the six-year process, I guess, did you start to feel like you developed your personal process for putting together a story? Uh, I think, uh, hold on. I, so the question is, uh, when you start producing, you're talking about my experience in, in Radio Ambulante? Uh, yes, yeah, so you learned um, how, how it worked, but how to put together a story radio show and put together a podcast as well. Um, 
but for you personally, how did you, at what point did you feel like you had learned, gotten into a regular rhythm with putting together a story the way that you wanted to? Yeah, I, um, like if you ask me, I would say two years ago, if you ask my team, they're born out. First, we just launched one, the first episode last week, and they were burnt out, and we have 10 ready. But it's, it's kind of like a, um, the thing with this, um, I think we are on a very like, workflow now. We, are, we will be able to produce 36 episodes, and we, have, we include some from our archive, so I think we're gonna reach like 40, 40 second, 42 episodes in a year, it's almost a year, uh, that will help us to complete a catalog of uh, like 100 and, 50 episodes or like more like 60 episodes which is a great archive and um, for the listener um, but we want to innovate so every time we want to do this we want to change the format or we want to pursue another story or we want to do something uh, something different you know like or more ambitious uh, like so we're producing a series about Venezuelans and there is a lot of racism in, in Latin America and we're like very concerned about it so we're producing like four stories this is about that in different countries, uh, transnational, um, you know, like so, so, so it's like a, it's a never stopping. Like we are always feeling, like when I I I get a grant, I celebrate it. Wow! But I spend it right away. It's like it's like a, then again I'm like oh my god! It's like the but I hire people. I like we have translators now. I have like a, when I hired my first fact checker two months later, I have like four fact checkers, and it's like you know so. Um, but I, I think we know we have a, a workflow that works now. And by now, my senior editor doesn't want to move anything. She's very like strict about it. Yes. How do you deal with stories that are too controversial or too can we get too political, too I don't know religious? So t to try to keep the story unbiased, or that it sounds like you are really just trying to cover both po points of view, or just one. I don't know, do you have any topics that are prohibited, or, you know? Okay, yeah, I, I think in general, the, like, we believe in, in civil liberties, so we are liberal, I guess, like, like, we want to bring stories that nobody produces, like, we want to tell those stories that, that are not covered by media, and many of those are, like, uh, like, trying to, exactly to do, like, to, to we, we believe in, in uh, women's rights, reproduction rights, LGBTQ community. Like, uh, uh, we want to understand racism better in Latin America. Uh, we, you know, like, so like, uh, um, there are many, many stories that are not told uh, that we want to cover. What we do, we always try because it's a journalism project. We always try to find the, the other, the other side of the story. Um, and uh, and we sometimes want to make sure that we use the right. No, sometimes no. We always want to, make, if it's very controversial, we usually have a lawyer. We need to review the, if it's like a policy or like a legal story, we need to, we, we, we have lawyers betting the, the script. Uh, and if it's something that we want to make sure, like an indigenous story or like a LGBTQ, or we find an expert on them from the country and on the matter, to review the, the script and make sure that we're using the right language. Uh, that's very important for us, like not having this, like, oh, outsider look, and I'm gonna tell you like the story the, the way, because I didn't leave the story, so that's very important for us. Uh, one thing that I know we don't do, uh, because it, it has happened before, is that the host don't like to tell stories about the abuser or like, a, you know, like, I mean, we, our protagonists, the protagonists of the stories are not, we don't give megaphones to bad people. <laughs> I don't know how to say it differently, to tyrants or like, but we want them on radio if the story is about the other side. So, you, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, um, so I've never listened to your radio show, but I'm very, very interested now, like especially as a Latina, I love anything that involves activism and standing up for what I believe is right. So where do you suggest I start listening <laughs> as a first time listener? Uh, what's your like your interest? What's your activism about, or like what? What's everything you said? <laughs> okay. So in our website, there is um. Can I? Can I do? No. Okay. So if you go to radioambulante.org, there is um. This website will change. We we'll redesigned the website. Finally, it's, it's gonna be look better. But now for the next four or six months. 
uh, if you go to Traumula, the website, there is, there is a Spanish and English um, version. Now it's mirrored by, by the audio song in, in, in Spanish, but you can like, read everything around it in English. Uh, so in Spanish, you go and you find Filtrar on the left menu. It says Filtrar, and you can find stories there by, I um, don't oh know. You can, you can fi find stories there by, hold on, because there's, okay. Fi uh, by, by subject, by country, or by the, uh, length. And uh, I don't have by mood, uh, but I, I, will, I, I will actually incorporate that because <laughs> so people can alternate between one and the other one. Um, uh, free Press, Crudo Ecuador is a great story. That's from Ecuador, of course, and uh, it includes the president, so that's good. Um, uh, we have many, like five stories or six LGBTQ from Puerto Rico and Costa Rica. Costa Rica has a fantastic story, it's more recent, I'm thinking about. We have mental health, we have um, reproductive rights, yeah, like um, a fight against racism, yeah. So, so I think it's better to start on the, on the menu. And in, in English, in the English language side of the website, I think it's called discovery, I think. But if you go to filtrar and then go and find English, it will just take you there. Okay, you have that? Yeah. Um, would you consider television in the future as a media outlet? Uh, yeah, no, not for, for audience, not for our stories. We're, um, like, if, like my team, they want to do this forever. Uh, like this is the format and this is the play. Like Rambulante will be Rambulante podcast. What we're thinking is um, we're in conversations to maybe produce series out of our content or things like that, but more like fiction, fictionalized. It's like another like revenue stream that maybe we can do in the future, but it's so distracting and it's so hard to, to put together, but just that way, we, we are not considering like other formats like that seems like another business. <laughs> yes. Have you done stories uh, focusing on the family uh, separation issue right now? Yeah, we did one. Um, uh, like you interviewed the reporter, uh, the, the first story that came with the audio, so uh, those recording of the children at the shelters, uh, at the detention shelters, huh? the, at the detention centers uh, that was reported by Ginger Thompson from ProPublica. She's uh, fluent in Spanish, she's a, a great reporter, and she's also a colleague and a friend. Uh, and uh, so that was very, very, we usually take a, lo a long time, but uh, with that one, we put together a story. We actually closed our season and that was happening. So we, we've, we had the access to do it and, and work with some, so we put together an episode to try to explain that mostly to Latin America. And because the Latin Americans only hear about this from the CNN perspective. And we want to make sure that we can like also like, like, like put there. And we are pursuing another, another stories. Uh, uh, regarding that, we're following a couple of stories. One of the co-founders of Rambulat uh, uh, works at the New York Times. Her name is Annie Correal. She has been like covering this lately for the New York Times of the stories, and she was at the Daily, uh, uh, the other podcast, NPR, uh, New York Times podcast. So we're gonna probably put together something because she has a lot of recordings in Spanish. That uh, so they, we're gonna do something with her as well. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we want to follow. Terran, yes. I just really uh, 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 appreciate your um, interest in the humanities, you know, to covering people's stories and to tell the stories like they are, uh, um, and sort of your entrepreneurial uh, spirit. And I know that's something that we are trying to very much promote on our campus, is to, with any uh, uh, given field or discipline, that there are ways to think entrepreneurially about these things and to maybe produce products or services that could be useful to many people out there. And I think your project is just, just a prime example of, of that. And so uh, for the students here and other people who, are, who might be interested in, you know, I want to maybe turn my idea into something like this, what kind of uh, advice do you have for people? Because I know that you know, it wasn't always easy for you. Right? Face failures. It's hard every day. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, uh, uh, like uh, I'm going to tell you a secret that is an, a very like uh, everybody knows this secret uh, for entrepreneurs. Is being an entrepreneur is a very isolating uh, thing, 
and I have a team of 14. They all need me, and I have my voice on production, mostly production reporters and journalists, but it's, it's hard because for me, it's like uh, I have a little team, uh, two people more on my team, but it's like really like I have to make sure that this works. And I was telling every, some, somebody earlier that I feel that I, when they say, well, what do you do as a CEO? And I was like, yeah, I ride into my bike every morning, and if I stop pedaling, the town loses electricity. You know, like this is, or like, oh, and this is, this is the night, the funnier way, because every morning I come to work super motivated. I have a lot of drive and energy and motivation and mostly many ideas. So I come to work with full of ideas, and I feel that I get into this lake of mud and that I need to cross to the other corner. And then when I'm in the middle, I'm just like giving up. And then in the, in the evening, I feel that a failure because I couldn't complete all the great things that I would, was supposed to do. And that's, that's, that happens to entrepreneurs. Uh, I think um, the, my advice is this, um, because I work a lot about, about around culture. So I, my, my dilemma, uh, which I always know what is the right thing to do based on my take on this is, uh, should we use all these resources to grow and expand and you know like uh, report more or should I just like invest also on, on a team and I choose to invest on my team because they work very hard and I just try to work on culture you know like on the culture of the organization and the way I do it my advice to to everyone who wants to like because when you start a project it's a little thing you know and it was just like a project of like a couple and suddenly it was bigger than us, and it has been like there have been tears and and uh, panic and and also like no money, no you know like I mean we took vacation after four years this summer it was like hard, um, sacrifice a lot of sacrifice, uh, but also rewarding. But but my my advice is you 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 start with a little thing and maybe that that thing is little for a for a long time and that's better hopefully, uh, if it's not you if you don't need to to grow capacity but. My advice is that you just like write down your values and your personal mission and make sure that you are like pursuing your mission. So for example, my personal mission is to make sure that I help journalism. But for me, I believe in like having good journalism. This is my personal thing. I don't share this with my team or like, but I just work, everything that I do in life is thinking about helping like what, whatever I can on journalism. So I train people, coach people, share what I learned. You know, you know like when, when I, we were starting, people didn't share what they knew. You know, it took us like two years of like, like punches of like learning. So, so I think writing the, the values and trying to translate that to the project, whatever you're doing, is, is, a, is a good start because that will keep you anchored. And you know like uh, everything that you grow or if you keep it small will reflect what you believe in. And, uh, and it will be a, a, a good way to mitigate the stress. Um, the other thing that I, that I feel is just learning and connecting with other entrepreneurs and learning from mistakes from others, like trying to go to, to business, like things, you know, like a business uh, in, in the, all the whole way, like try to, to, to learn, just like be exposed to other people starting things, even if they're out of your, or your industry. Yeah. All right, with that, I want to thank you again for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you.